The amount of time that people have lived in the United States has a dramatic impact on how they vote and how they see the country. What are your concerns, just generally speaking, about your party moving forward as a conservative Latina? We need to be much more careful in understanding that young Latino voters are really going to shape the future. To the contrary, this week our special guest is Leslie Sanchez, a Republican strategist, former George W. Bush White House staff member, and of course a longtime To the Contrary panelist. Leslie is now working for CBS News and uh, as a marketer and marketing to women and Hispanics. She's an expert in that area. Welcome. To back to To the Contrary. It's great Leslie. to be home. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Yeah. Let's talk about where the Latino and specifically Latina vote is heading. Uh, George W. Bush had 44% of the Hispanic vote. Donald Trump had 33%. Um, tell me about the high water marks and where these people are headed in the future for politicians who want to secure their votes. Sure, I mean, to look at, at Donald Trump, you have to kind of go back and see historically how did he perform. Republicans have earned about 31.5% of the Hispanic vote for the last average. 10, on average, for the last 10 presidential elections. So the, the high watermark being George W. Bush, the low watermark being Bob Dole in 1996. And some people would say that the president came in right on par. So it wasn't in the low 20s, which was anticipated based on a lot of the kind of white hot rhetoric against immigration and particularly uh, Mexico. The interesting part is people like to think immigration is the number one issue or top of mind issue for Latinos, but the Latinos are so extraordinarily diverse. So you have foreign born uh, individuals who, yes, it was, it was top of mind for them and their families, and then others who've been three, four, five, six, seven generations in the United States who see things more economically, more pocketbook issue, more kind of mainstream America. But it, it really is important, and it proves the point that the Latino vote is extraordinarily diverse. Uh, it depends on ethnicity, uh, kind of generationally, geopolitically, where they're located. Are they in a red and blue state? Are they married? Um, are they at, how, how many times do they attend church? There's so many different factors that are playing into it that you can't say it's one Latino vote, but it certainly shows the effect um, of the number of Latinos, especially in red states, that supported the president. You, you mentioned earlier that um, there some Latino families in the, in the U.S. go back six, seven generations. Sure. How do they differ from new entrants? Well, there, there's so many different factors. If you look at somebody who's, uh, who's foreign born, that was not born in the United States, the, the amount of time that people have lived in the United States has a dramatic impact on how they vote and how they see the country. If it's somebody who's only been here, they're a first generation or a new immigrant, uh, they're going to be focused more on immigration and the factors and how it affects their entire family. Somebody who's been here for multiple generations, they're really looking at pocketbook issues in the same way kind of mainstream America. How as much as healthcare, how much healthcare premiums are going up? Can they start that small business? Is their 401k going up or is it kind of flatlined? Those are real issues that just kind of mainstream whether they be small business owners, um, members of the military families and, and the veterans, uh, they're, they're really kind of tried and true bottom line pocketbook issues. Are you pleased with the way that the Trump administration has hired Latinas? What's the role? Who, who are the prominent ones? Sure. Um, if you're following the social media and the media, especially within the Latino press, you'll see some familiar faces. Uh, one being Jenny Korn, who is somebody who worked at the Republican National Committee. She has a very senior position in advising the president, but organizing a lot of the kind of grassroots, the public engagement and bringing and, and hosting events at the White House, but strategically thinking about who the president should meet with. Uh, she has a counterpart at 
got the uh, in the vice president's office, uh, Annalise Castillo, who's also very focused on engagement and getting support with business interest, um, uh, social good organizations that, that are focused on underserved communities. And, and in mainstream events, too, just talking about getting the economy going again. Uh, we see our new uh, treasurer of the United States is also a Latina. Uh, but in more senior cabinet positions, aside from the Department of Labor, there really wasn't a, a big movement in hiring uh, Latinos throughout to fill a lot of these assistant secretary positions. I think you're going to see more of that. More of my, uh, individuals I'm hearing about are looking to accept those positions, and they should be announced soon. Is it sweeping? No. Um, it, was it the first are announcement? Are Hispanics disappointed? The sense is that that these these are like golden rings that come around. You know, the opportunity to work for a, a Republican administration is something people wait their entire lives for. They work on the state level, on the grassroots level, the national level. They try. They have the pedigree, the relationships, the network. They did the sweat equity to get there. Uh, but Donald Trump didn't come through as a traditional Republican. He was an outsider. So you almost have the, the Trump supporters and then the establishment Republicans, and sometimes they don't necessarily meet. I have colleagues who've said, you know, they have very esteemed careers, very professional. They don't necessarily want to take the public risk of joining the administration. At the same time, there are many people who would think, would think it's an honor and a privilege to serve. Uh, it's just a new administration. It's a different style. But, and it, but what it, about voters? Let's talk about ah, outside voters, the Ah, voters, okay. Well, are, it depends on where you live. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, if you're in a red state like Texas and you ask you know, Latinos for Trump, if they still are Latinos for Trump, they'll say, absolutely. They like what he's doing. He's breaking up the system. He doesn't fall in line. He's not beholden to special interest. If you ask uh, Latinos and Mexican-American descent in California, they are starting to mobilize. They're starting to run, for example, California 45, which had the uh, district which uh, Javier Becerra was, uh, was vacating. You had numerous young millennial-type Latinos running on everything from a Bernie Sanders platform to a bit more kind of conservative Democrat. So it has awakened a new political movement on the West Coast. Uh, it, it's just different depending on kind of your perspective, your view of republicanism and particularly Washington. What do you think Democrats should do in 2018 and in 2020 about winning more Hispanic votes? Sure. I, it, the key about Latino vote is to understand that it's like molding jello. You know, it's always kind of in a fluid state until it really sets. And it may not set for two or three generations. It's an extremely diverse com a, a, a community that is extraordinarily young. So. Both parties uh, need to think about Latinos as a jump ball. It is something that is not necessarily going to be beholden, especially among millennials, to party ID. They're not going to go and embrace the donkey or the elephant. Uh, they're really going to coin to look at the individual candidate, and that's actually a good thing uh, for our to keep our democracy strong. I was just doing some research about immigration, and actually, because of Trump's rhetoric on. Uh, against Mexicans, against uh, Hispanics generally. Um, it, Central American immigration, both legal and illegal, as well as Mexican, is dropping precipitously. And they're being almost caught up by uh, South Asian immigration, right. a lot of people from India, for example. Um, and they're more educated. They're coming over with college degrees as opposed to Hispanics who where general 80% of Hispanics who enter this country don't even have a high school diploma. So what does that, first of all, what does that say to you about what both parties should be doing on immigration? And what does it say to you about uh, Latino loyalty to, or Hispanic loyalty to the Republican Party? Well, I think Republicans have been trying to build Hispanic loyalty uh, going back to Nixon. Um, and certainly, it wasn't until Ronald Reagan that you really started to have orchestrated campaigns that were effective because it really embraced the idea of bringing Latinos, regardless of where they were born, into the Republican fold as Americans and not kind of siloing people based on ethnicity or one or two particular issues. It's fascinating to think about this whole immigration uh, 
paradigm and how the impact it's having on elections because the demand for labor is going to continue to increase in a robust dynamic economy we need educated labor and you see silicon valley everybody arguing for H the h1b the kind of tech visa and those numbers are not high enough but you also have mainstream businesses and states and their economies relying on the labor uh, and so in argue the low wage labor that comes from the kind of farm workers or, or other types of visas uh, that debate is going to continue. What has to happen, though, is Republicans need to be strong and understanding if Donald Trump is going to move forward with the wall, which a lot of people say that he is, and the funding's already starting to be there, and we already have a lot of wall, by the way, <laughs> but you want to close the wall, that, that, that's, that's, that's one thing. There need to be many gates. There needs to be a way for commerce to move back and forth. There needs to be a debate that does not dehumanize any individual uh, in the way that kind of the caustic, hot, hostile tone that we've heard normally from... Uh, right, well, he's calmed sides. down, generally speaking, it's about fair. every issue. He still has his moments, but... Um, it, those but, are cringeworthy that, moments. That's what, that's that, what I... Do. Yeah, you, cringeworthy. They are exactly. cringeworthy. They make it extremely and, hard to grow... Uh, I, I'll tell you, on, on one hand, you speak to individuals who've thought about running for office who said, I'm going to keep my powder dry. I'm going to wait it out a couple of years and see how this shakes because it is a, he is disrupting Washington in many senses. Um, and if you're a Latino who doesn't necessarily live in a red district, you, you may want to wait it out, if, especially if you're in a purple area. But I think for the left, it's given them an opportun opportunity to embolden a new generation. Because if you think about the fact that about 44% of the Latinos that are el eligible to vote are young millennials, it is really this younger voter that that's going to shape the, the, the next several election cycles, especially when it comes to running for president. Um, and I know a woman from Bolivia, uh, very active in her local Bolivian community. And she said they were all voting uh, for Trump because they came here legally. They didn't like seeing all uh, the Central Americans coming here illegally. And they actually supported a guy because I, the Trump, like Trump, because I was thinking after what he said about the judge, uh, about immigrants generally speaking, how could somebody, uh, you know, who comes from a Latino country uh, and speaking the language, support a candidate like that? There's some people who felt that the president was tone deaf, um, that he didn't really understand how it was heard within the Hispanic community. Did he have people around him that could guide him on those efforts? But the one thing about the president, he's extraordinarily authentic. This is how he sees the world. This is how he says it. People find that refreshing. But to the bigger point, people felt that if you violated our rule of law, if you had no respect for the rule of law on immigration, um, on any other issue, then how could you accept, expect to sustain a robust economy, a, a robust democracy? That's really where a lot of people kind of fundamentally felt. If you came here illegally, I understand. Maybe we have some compassion, certainly for the dreamers. I think, you know, for, for the, the undocumented students who were brought here at a very young age. But what's the right approach, the right balance? And the truth is, it's not going to be this caustic, hot language on the, on the right. And it's not going to be wide, open borders on the left. It's, it's going to be a sensible middle. And hopefully, that's something um, that, that President Trump may be able to accomplish. What are your concerns, just generally speaking, about your party moving forward as a conservative Latina? We need to be much more careful in understanding that young Latino voters are really going to shape the future. Uh, they don't have the same sensibility that we did even a generation ago. They, are they as religious as uh, their parents? Uh, they, they're as faith-oriented. You do see the evangelism. If anything is consistent, the evangelism of Latinos is continuing to be very strong. Um, it's strong in non-traditional Hispanic states, uh, and you're seeing that movement. And they're starting to just now exercise and stretch their political power, which is something that the black community had done for, for decades, but it's very new because of, you know, charismatic Catholic and, and kind of the Protestant movement within uh, the, the Latino community. That is true. Entrepreneurial Latinos are looking to have access to capital. They're looking for regulation to be smaller. They need to get on the on-ramp for mainstream business faster. 
um, and it goes a step further. In corporate America, they're looking for diversity on the boards, diversity at senior leadership in the C-suite, uh, you know, somewhere that they feel that they're culturally accepted. And and the thing about Latino that that I, I always try to explain to, to people is we're finding our way. There isn't one like, oh, I'm Latino and I'm this or I'm that. It's like it's a fluid process, like a lot of us in our careers. And they're learning how to get engaged in different ways politically. Some will run for office. Some will raise money. Some will start social advocacy groups. Some will create you know, other venues and opportunities. But they're going to do it digitally. They're going to do it in ways that don't apply. The, the old rules don't apply. And we have to keep up. We have to engage. And we have to respect. And I think with young people, that's the thing we all <laughs> we sometimes forget. And I want to touch on your entrepreneurial background and all you've done because you are truly a digital whiz. I remember you having a, 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 an Instagram account or a, a Twitter account, I'm sorry, Twitter account when you did the show. This goes back like 15 years and you already had thousands of followers <laughs> when I was just trying to figure out what Twitter was. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, what are you yeah. doing on your marketing side? Let's shift to your marketing sure, side. Sure, sure. What are you, tell me about how how companies are marketing to Latinas. Sure. The, the interesting part is I left Washington after 17 years and went to the West Coast to really understand more about mobile technology, mobile marketing, data analytics, and, and propensity buying, because there was not necessarily propensity voting on mobile. Um, and, and really, if you want to see where the, the country is going in terms of those technologies and the convergence of, of that, and whether it's commerce or media, you have to be in Silicon Beach or Silicon Valley. It's just the, it's the one of the most remarkable places in the world. There's not a lot of women there. There's not a lot of women So in you're color. in Northern Cal. Uh, I spent time in Northern Cal, but we set up in Silicon Beach, mm -hmm. which was just to, to be around very iterative individuals and companies. Uh, and that's the, a very distinct different fr difference from politics. Politics is a little bit slower. And, you know, it, it's meant to be gridlock moving. Over there, you're already late uh, wherever you are. You're always like, t you're two, hours, two days behind. You don't even know you're behind until you get there. But it, it's, it's the fresh ideas and the new ways to use technology uh, to, to spread messages and, and help compel brands. I think that's what brands are looking at now, is having something Donald Trump's been able to do, a very authentic one-on-one -on -one conversation with people. Technology allows you to do that. And some How? Of the, it, it's unfiltered. And, and for better or for yeah, worse... Yeah, but are you talking about like ads on your cell phone or ads on Facebook or... Sure, sure. You know, it's, it's really funny. In branding particularly, it, it used to be a very sweeping, well, kind of composed, structured ad. But the thing, particularly young people or people going to 44, we call that young, uh, are responding to are real people. It's not necessarily a contrived or very manufactured. It's something that's messy. It's something that's honest. Um, is always going to get the better response. Uh, it, and it's also companies that are really committed to the idea of their kind of social governance, their role. And that's what you're seeing more people attracted to. What is tell, their... Tell me about the use of big data... Ah. To, to target particular groups like Latinas, like women of sure. color. Um, In Hollywood, all the talk is Latino. Uh, Latino consumers, Latino people, individuals that open. Uh, Latinos was, go at a larger percent to openings uh, for any movie. So you have major mo motion picture industries really targeting multiple trailers and teasers in Spanish, bilingual, bicultural, uh, Spanglish, you know, young, old, radio. And, and, and it's it's done in multiple formats. You'll have some that target, for, for example, evangelical Latino in Spanish because they know that they like paranormal uh, kind of movies. It's amazing how that is really a focus. And you've seen the change and transformation in Hollywood, how there's more shows now uh, that are either with Latino characters or just kind of raising the idea beyond traditional story lines, but just something unique and different just about family. And that's, I think, where the country's going. It's not that it's going to be siloed as this Latino thing. It's just kind of an American thing. There are pockets of change that are blending, and it's not just Latino. It's Asian. It's it, you Yeah, know, but it's, tell me about the... We were talking earlier b before we started taping the show. Tell me about the actual... How the megadata, how it's used, how companies that you're working with are uh, using technology to target those people. 
Well, there's a lot of technology available to really get an understanding of what consumers want. Uh, there's everything that they buy from major data houses like Axiom or um, uh, just... And what do they ones. buy? Where you live, your name, your email address? Well, sure, what sure. It? Well, it, they're, they're trying to get to propensity buying uh, behavior. So uh, what kind of things do you like to buy? How often do you buy them? Uh, what kind of economic zip code do you live in? You, you can layer on. It's really about layering, right? So you're layering on all these different pieces of, of information to get a profile, an unidentified profile, but a profile of an individual, perhaps a female, who likes to buy these types of things. And, and we tease, most people see it in real life when they go and click on a shoe you know, somewhere and don't buy it, but everywhere they go, that shoe is following them. You know, <laughs> that's, the, that's kind of the joke of, about how uh, it's redirecting advertising back at you multiple times to try to get a click rate, to try, and, and really what, what what major companies are trying to do is get you into the shopping cart, into that e-commerce experience, and get you to close and check out of that shopping mm -hmm. cart. Because a lot of people, a large percentage, leave goods in the shopping cart. Right? Sure. So if you can I do move, it all the time. All the time. you got open shopping carts all don't, over the place. Don't make me sign in and register. <laughs> Let me check out as, as a, a guest. guest. Because if you try to force me... Which some companies do that's true. to sign up. I'm not giving all that information to you. Right. So the idea is is understanding what are the low barriers to get you in, engaged in this new e-commerce kind of economy, and checked out with your pocketbook as e you know as easily as possible. You don't even have to have your credit card anymore. You put it in once, and you just kind of like swipe it everywhere you go. And they have no compunctions about overdoing it, do they? Well, they're I mean, do they ever think, God, I've emailed this person five times today. Maybe I should stop. Well, that gets a lot into some different parts of ad tech that I'm not as familiar with. But I, I would say that there's always a, a conversation about what works. That's really where they're getting, coming down to. It's like, is it reaching you? You may get annoyed by it, but do you ultimately click and buy the shoe? I, that's, that's basically where it's coming to, is if it's effective, they're going to keep using this, but it's always changing. Um, and there's regulations that are actually put in place that are, you know, there's uh, multiple mechanisms that can, you know, kind of change the way that individual uh, kind of data companies and ad companies can target you. So there are protections there. Uh, I mean, should people needed. be worried? Should we be worried about companies knowing too much about us? I, I personally feel, while I think the internet is way overloaded with ads, pop-ups, this and that, you know, they've invented all kinds of things to, to keep you away from the content you're trying to seek and buttons you have to push to get out of it. Um, but uh, do I generally also feel that if they know my name and address and, and that I like a certain kind of dresses, I don't really care. Many people would argue that, that it's for ease of use to make your life easier and your experience better, because it's about your user experience. It's exciting, it's good for you, and it, and it ultimately, it, it, you reward them by purchasing these items. So it's ease of use for you, things at work. For every time you say that there's pop-up ads, there's someone designing something to stop pop-up ads. So there's always this game of back and forth of where the right balance is. And, and there, some people think, it's wonderful to have ease of use, especially young people who want everything, instant gratification, right away, coupons. There's a, there's a coupon, you know, a plug-in called Honey, which you can buy, and every site you go to, it tells you if there's a discount. So that's one way to save money. A lot of people appreciate that. And, but it pops up every single e-commerce site you go to, whether you're buying an airline ticket or a pair of shoes. So you can call it a nuisance or you can call it a convenience, but it's something you chose to participate in. It just depends how you use the technology and how you, in having control of, to some extent, what ads, you can set parameters on what follows you and uh, what well, you share. But see, ad blocks, anytime I even try to block cookies, 50% of the sites won't let me on because I'm blocking cookies. <laughs> so how do you, how do you use ad blocks to, is it possible to log on and do a search for something and not get hit with all these ads? Because it is getting to the point, I think, where it it's too much ad, advertising on the Internet. It's annoying and it's... Right. Um, I, I don't know that I'm the one to answer that question. Uh, because it, And the reason I would say, Bonnie, is it changes so much and so fast that where it was even 18 months ago 
is different from what it is today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> this was terrific, sure. and we'll have to do it again soon. No, there are so many different conversations, and, and technology is only making it easier to have them. Thank you, Leslie Sanchez, for all your time and all your insights. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbay and at To The Contrary. Please visit our pbs.org slash To The Contrary website. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next time. Bye.